Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. After a very dense Saturday with full of games overlapping with each other, I decided to talk about three games. Villa's Massacre against Brighton, Wolves' surprise win against City, and Bayern against their nightmare opponent RB Leipzig. In all games, we saw how important the holding midfielder role became in football, and lacking one creates problems for the teams trying to be the protagonist of the game and play position of football. Let's go chronologically and start with Aston Villa Brighton game and talk about Emery's masterclass. Brighton have been one of the most exciting teams, especially with Roberto De Zerbi. No doubt that his unique ideas in build-up play have already helped the evolution of the game of football. However, Emery studied Brighton very well and came up with a really good plan that nullifies Brighton's strengths and amplifies their weaknesses. Without the ball, Villa used different approaches at three different blocks. At high block, they wanted to keep their plus one at the back line, so they initially used three players to stop four central Brighton players. It can be said the structure was close to a 3-2-3-2, with Konsa as a plus one at the back line, Pau Torres following well back at the half space, Kamara closer to Ferguson who drops deep to link up, but also still keeping the option to jump on Brighton's pivot, fullbacks on wingers, Zaniolo and McKean on fullbacks. The structure forced Brighton to play towards the left side as Luis on Gilmer, Watkins on Webster. As Brighton played towards left, Villa press was triggered and Diaby was jumping on dunk. We all know Brighton are one of the best teams regarding their build-up completion rate and they rarely lost the ball against Villa's high press as well. But Villa's approach limited Brighton's central progression and their link-up with their pivots and central attackers at the center of the regions. As they also could keep their plus one at the back line, Brighton's diagonal long balls to their wingers also didn't work as effectively as it usually does. So although Brighton could keep the ball, they couldn't progress with advantage. Emery's team was also great at regrouping at mid-block. When Brighton could pass the first pressure, Villa settled on a 4-4-2 mid-block. They were aggressive at mid-block with a man-oriented zonal approach, so whenever central attackers dropped deep to connect, Konsa and Torres followed them, while Kamara and Luis played very close to Brighton's double pivot. Brighton normally rotates to a 2-3-5 structure as they settle against mid-blocks, but Villa defenders constantly bothered them at mid-block and didn't allow them to settle comfortably and forced them to make mistakes. If Brighton managed to push Villa to low blocks, then Villa were becoming more cautious don't hesitate to add more players to backline against potential 5-man overloads of Brighton, but becoming more passive and focusing on limiting the space by protecting their zone. The passage before Aston Villa's second goal was perfectly summarizing Emery's plan in out of possession phase. As Brighton restart the game, Villa high press with 3 players forces Brighton to play left side. Dunk hardly finds Ferguson, dropping deep, who is tightly followed by Kamara, he keeps possession somehow and allows Brighton to breathe, so Brighton could move higher a bit but progression came without any advantage as Villa settled back to their high press structure again. After that Aston Villa wait Brighton to disconnect from the goalkeeper to continue the game with 10 vs 10. As Brighton could move higher with a carry of their wider position center back, Aston Villa settled to their 4-4-2 at mid block. At this point, Kamara approaches to Hinslewood and Konsa to Ferguson. They swiftly shift without leaving any space for Brighton to further progress. The man-oriented zonal press limits passing options to central players. Even though they receive the ball at the central regions, their marker immediately applies pressure and doesn't allow time to use the ball efficiently. As Brighton progressed towards wider areas again without advantage and Aston Villa moved to low block, we see Villa midfielders don't hesitate to drop deep to the last line to prevent any 5 vs 4 overload. Here Kamara follows in Silwood. If Estupinian joins the last line then McKean follows him usually and Villa use a back line of 5. As Brighton cannot find any space they circulate ball to bait Villa press. Villa swiftly go back to their high press structure again with their plus 1 at the back line with Konsa to be cautious against Brighton's long ball threats. Again, super tactical discipline to switch between different blocks and finally force opponent to make mistake at mid-block. Villa was much faster at the transition and Gilner was out of his position. 
and it ended with Watkins and Miller's second goal. Emery's team was completely aware of Brighton's weaknesses at their double pivot. Their plan in possession was to exploit that. Brighton almost always used man marking when they press high, and Emery's build-up plan was to bait Brighton players to come closer and then play a long ball. They had two tall players at the tip to fight for aerial duels, Watkins and Zaniola, and Diaby next to them to use him in 1v1s. When it came to second balls, Douglas Lewis was much faster than his marker Gilmer to sprint and join the attack and recover those balls dropping from aerial deals, and Vida's third goal came as a result of this plan. Gilmer's deficiency as the holding midfielder was also apparent in Villa's first goal. He made a mistake in his positioning and couldn't jump on McKean effectively. That resulted in a lot of time and space for McKean and he played the true ball to Cash who made the assist of the goal. It was certainly a masterclass from Emery, who is undoubtedly a great tactician, but it was also a fact that the service team was predictable at every phase of the game with some clear weaknesses. After losing Caicedo and not properly filling his space, these problems are likely to continue happening for Brighton. Manchester City were another team missing their first holding midfielder choice. Rodri is a monster and by far the best holding midfielder in the world right now. City can replace very valuable players in their squad like De Bruyne, Ruben Diaz, Bernardo Silva, even Holland with tactical tweaks and squat that, but Rodri in Guardiola's plan is irreplaceable. It was a bit too much for Kovacic to replace Rodri. Wolves coach Gary O'Neill also made a great decision to start the game with a back five instead of four. As you know, City usually don't use their common 3-2-2-3 structure and instead build up with 3-1 against opponents using back fives to attempt to overload the back line with 6 players. For a holding midfielder, it is of course even harder to play with one less player next to him, so this decision put extra pressure on Kovacic. In addition, O'Neill's plan at low block was extremely effective to limit space for City attackers. Usually low blocks are very zonal and passive, but Wolves were very aggressive at low block and constantly bothered City players through a man-oriented zonal press as well. Toti Gomez was not hesitating to leave the back line and jump on the City player at the half space while Lemina and Joao Gomez were marking other two City attacking midfielders in their zones. Dawson was on Haaland and Kilman was offering plus one at the back line. The aggression of Wolves players really bothered City at chance creation and this season for the first time City couldn't exceed 1xG in a game. In addition to this great defensive plan and implementation, Neto was fully ready and created a huge superiority over City defenders, especially at transitions over the huge space. Going back to Kovacic, he was not as strong as Rodri in duels and recovery, sometimes took extra risks in his passes, but more than this, City actually really missed Rodri's extra offensive contribution. It was not a coincidence that Rodri's goals, if not from a set piece, came against opponents using back fives. Inter game, Sheffield game, Red Star game, all used back fives and Rodri's goal came when they tend to defend at low block. Because there is one less man in midfield and Rodri is extremely good with his timing of his late runs to the box. And it would be perfect for him to attack the box while all other central attackers were man marked by Wolves defenders. Kovacic may be a bit scared of losing his position, didn't make those runs and was much more conservative with his take-ons. Talking about these two teams and the importance of holding midfielders, we should also talk about Bayern and Tuchel, who has been openly asking for a holding midfielder from Bayern board since the beginning of the season. Kimmich is an excellent deep-lying playmaker, but he can sometimes lose his position in defensive transitions and in out-of-possession phase, which makes Bayern defense a bit more vulnerable. Against RB Leipzig, Bayern struggled to hold the midfield area again, but I think this time it was not Kimmich's fault, and it was mostly related with Tuchel's backline structure against Leipzig's extremely narrow and dynamic attackers. Tuchel's plan against RB Leipzig's 4-2-2-2 was to use a 3-2 at the tip that forces opponent to play wide and traps them there. The higher part, that part worked well, however the backline had problems. There was a 5v4 at the back, Kimmich was a free sweeper in front of the back line and the back 4 was supposed to mark Leipzig's 4 attackers. However, as these players 
played very narrow to each other, we saw Bayern backline had a lot of hesitation to leave their zone and stick on their players. This resulted in 2v1s around Kimmich and a ticket for Leipzig to escape from Bayern press mainly. Tuchel could have been more adventurous and could have tried uncommon narrower structures at the base, which was something Nagasman tested before against another RB team, actually RB Salzburg, and against their narrow 442 diamond structure. In Tuchel's structure, we saw fullbacks were very hesitant to leave wide areas empty, although there were nobody, and that hesitation affected the center backs as well. Eventually, the first goal and the progression before the corner kick that brought the second goal all came because of that hesitation about the jumps of the backline. RB Leipzig's plan in out of position phase completely stopped Bayern's progression in the first half as well. Bayern initially used the narrow 3 2 base to build up, Davis was joining the final line to make a line of 5, while RB Leipzig used their usual 4 2 2 2 with narrow tip to defend as well. Paulsen and Openda were closing passing channels to Kimmich and Goretzka, while when Leimer and Kim had the ball, Forsberg and Chovy Simons were pressing while shadowing wider passing options. Schlager and Campbell behind Paulsen and Openda to limit passing options to in front of the last line, especially to half spaces, and there were still two players at the back line to be alerted against forward runs and long balls. Except the position at the third minute that Musiala missed for Bayern, Bayern couldn't create any chances, anything at all in the first half. They could barely move the ball to the final third. Although problems during out of position phase continued in the second half, Tuka's diagnosis and changes helped Bayern when they had possession. In the second half, Bayern switched to a 4-1-4-1 with Guerrero playing at left half space. In out of possession, this 4-1-4-1 was again turning into a 4-1-3-2 and same problems about the backline continued in the second half as well, but in possession, the 4-1 base helped to stretch RB Leipzig's front four. As they stretched, Bayern found better angles to connect with Kane, and if RBL resisted not to stretch, then Bayern could progress around RBL's structure. They could create overloads at wider areas, which helped them to find space to move the ball. This helped Bayern to be more dynamic with the ball, switch the momentum of the game and create more threats against RB Leipzig. But it was not enough to get a win against their opponents. This brings us to the end of this week's victory report. Long story short, Rodri is an amazing player and it is hard to win games without a player like him. Of course, there are different ways to play attractive football and still win without holding midfielders like the Italian approach, the functional approach to the game with registers. But for more positional approaches, having a proper holding midfielder can make a huge difference. Otherwise, the coach needs to be more innovative and adventurous to close this weakness. Thanks for watching my video. If you like this video, please don't forget to press the like button and subscribe to my channel. Until next time.